Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. It is Towergate day number 1035, 1035, February 6th, 2020, Thursday. Thank you so much for tuning in. Okay, well as all of you know by now, uh, Trump has been acquitted. It was pretty much a party line vote uh, with the exception of Mitt Witt Willard voting uh, um, guilty, that Trump was guilty on, on the first article of uh, abuse of power. Uh, this did not really surprise me, to be honest with you. Um, I was surprised uh, by a couple of other people, though I must say Democrats I'm talking about, uh, because eventually uh, Murkowski and um, what's her name, Susan Collins, uh, they both did not vote uh, to indict. So it looks like Mitt Witt Romney Willard is the only one who actually did that. Um, and for that, it is my strong belief that uh, he should be expelled from the Republican Party. Uh, he should be, if that's possible, if you can do that, I think he should be kicked out of the Republican Party. He should no longer be able to be a Republican. Now, he can go become an independent or a Democrat. He's a liberal Democrat, so he might as well become a Democrat. That's where he should go. In the event that that cannot be done, I would expect that every Republican member of Congress should diss him. Every Republican organization should uh, deny him access or privilege to attend any functions. And most importantly, the Republican National Committee, uh, as well as any other Republican fundraising organizations, should, debri should deprive him of any money uh, going to his uh, re-election campaign uh, coming from Republican donors. I think that uh, that's probably the best we can do, and I hope to God at the first opportunity uh, folks in Utah will vote his ass out. And if you voted for Mitt Romney and you live in Utah, you should probably be ashamed of yourself because he did have a challenger who was also a Mormon who was a Trump supporter. You have no excuse. You had an opportunity. And if you live in Utah, you chose incorrectly. Let's not forget that when Mitt Witt Willard was running for president uh, in that dismal so-called campaign he ran against Obama, he uh, went to Trump and asked for money and his endorsement. And once he got it, he came out and proclaimed how proud he was to have gotten Trump's endorsement and his money. Mitt Witt is a backstabber. <clears throat> he is a vulture capitalist. He's never done a damn thing for this country. Not a damn thing. Now, my senator, who I watch very closely, we have two of them here. Of course, one of them's a Democrat uh, and, a, and a rotten Reverend Clinton acolyte. But the other is, of course, a kind of an anti-Trumper. He actually is an anti-Trumper, but Trump is so popular uh, in our state that he has no choice but to pretend. Um, he's a pretend Trump supporter. His name is Rob Portman. Now, Rob Portman did uh, not vote to indict the president. Uh, he did vote to acquit, but he did so uh, kind of with an asterisk by stating that, well, what Trump did I think was wrong and uh, he probably should have been censored, whatever. Well, no, 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 I didn't go for that. So I, like many Ohioans today, uh, I, I'm sure, I know I, I, I sent off a fairly clean but fiery email to the office of Rob Portman to let him know that I look forward to uh, voting uh, against his opponent and that hopefully he will have a challenger and that I will vote for him and that I'm very, very disappointed uh, in his behavior and uh, let's just leave it at that. But I made it pretty clear to my senator of how I felt about the way he approached this and I let him know I'm not fooled. I know he doesn't like Trump and that's fine with me because I don't like him and I'll vote against him at the first opportunity and I would love to see him replaced by someone who actually supports the president and supports uh, the rule of law. The entire process was a hoax and it was a scam. And that's exactly what Mr. Portman should have come out and said. Instead, he played that middle of the road game that he always plays because he is a sissy. He has no backbone, none whatsoever. F you, Rob Portman. Now, uh, I was surprised that Joe Manchin um, did not vote to acquit. Kirsten Cinema did not vote to acquit. And Doug Jones committed political suicide. Now, my guess is in the case of Doug Jones, he probably didn't have much chance because had he not voted to acquit, 
uh, I think that the Democratic Party would have probably uh, uh, made him pay. Uh, so I don't think Doug Jones was a winning position for him to take. And, his, and I, I hope that Jeff Sessions is not uh, the eventual winner of that. But if he is the winner of that, uh, I, I think Doug Jones is going to lose to whichever of those Republicans win that uh, primary contest in, uh, in Louisiana, or Alabama rather, uh, whichever one wins that contest, I believe will beat Doug Jones. And I don't think it will be nearly as close. Remember the last time it was a fiasco with that race in Alabama, and that's the only reason Doug Jones uh, even emerged to win that race. So I believe that seat will fall solidly back to a real uh, Republican, uh, and hopefully a good conservative one uh, in 2020. Uh, so, yeah, Doug Jones signed his political death warrant uh, with that vote, but I think that either way he would have signed his political death warrant. Um, at least ways he'll get the money now. I think for Kirsten Cinema, a lot of the same probably is true, although it really changed the way I feel about her. As of yesterday's video, I told you I was starting to feel pretty good about her, but I was very disappointed in her vote. She knows she voted incorrectly, but I think a lot of that vote came down to politics and wanting support from the party uh, and you know they can cut off your money they can cut off your money and I'm sure every Democratic senator was told if you vote uh, if you do not vote to uh, to uh, uh, vote guilty for Trump if you vote to acquit him you you will get cut off and I think that that's probably uh, and, and that's the that's the that's the silver bullet and any political party uh, when the people who control the money tell you they're cutting off the money, that usually is the thing that will get that will move you uh, in the way the party wants you to go. And I think that's probably what happened in the case of Kirsten Cinema. Now, in the case of Mansion, that's going to be uh, a lot more tricky. Uh, I don't think he's up this uh, year for re-election. Um, I don't think so. But and that's probably why he voted that way. But uh, in a state where Trump won like 70% of the vote, uh, still, I imagine that uh, Manchin's uh, inbox today was uh, over, over overflowing with uh, a lot of uh, uh, very angry people. And uh, maybe he feels that uh, people will forget about this and in a couple of years from now, uh, the next election, I guess 2022 or whenever, 2024, whenever he comes back up again, uh, I think he thinks by then people will have forgotten and he'll be able to hold on to that seat. Um, uh, it, it's hard to say what the political calculations were for all these people, but the bottom line is uh, Trump, uh, of course, just as we all knew when this thing started, I mean, what, what we learned yesterday, we knew before the thing even began that you weren't going to get two thirds of, uh, of the Senate to, you know, indict the president. Uh, remove him from office. We, so the outcome was already known. It's just how it would all play itself out. And a lot of people had to put their head on the political chopping block and make those decisions. And that's, that's where all those decisions were made. They were made on politics, not on the rule of law, right or wrong, or anything else. That's just the bottom line truth of all this. It was a political shit show. And that's what you get in a shit show. A lot of shit. Now, <clears throat> Uh, let's move on. Well, it appears that Grassley and Johnson have requested uh, from the Secret Service all of Hunter Biden's travel records uh, for the time uh, uh, that Biden was vice president. Because remember, um, whenever Biden would go on these trips, if Hunter Biden was with him, he would get Secret Service protection. And I'm not sure if Biden gets Secret Service protection since uh, Biden left office, but probably not. I don't think vice president's kids continue to get Secret Service protection after uh, they've left office. Biden probably does, but his kids probably not after he's left office. But still, there'll be a lot of uh, very uh, interesting things to learn from these uh, records, these, these travel records, uh, and we'll find out exactly uh, a lot of the details about um, well, the details that we'll get from these Secret Service records are 
because we know we see Hunter Biden getting on the plane with Daddy O to go to China or to go here or to go there, but we don't really know about once they get there about the meetings are held and who meetings are held with and all these sorts of things. But now we'll get that information because the Secret Service would have to be with Hunter Biden on these trips, and if he broke away from Daddy O to go have private meetings with certain officials or what have you in China or wherever, then uh, that is going to be documented in this, and I think that's what Grassley and Johnson are looking for, is who did Hunter Biden meet with in China when he went on those trips or anywhere else. So uh, we will see how that turns out, and uh, I'm glad that Grassley and Johnson are pursuing these things. It's just that the problem is, in Congress, things move so slow. I mean, I could literally be dead, and many of you as well, before you know, Grassley might be dead, certainly, before any of these documents ever see the light of day. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy that they're making the effort, but it's, it's too little, too late, and a process is too slow and really will not produce very much. Um, anything that would be truly damaging will be uh, hidden uh, or delayed. Uh, there'll be um, uh, probably uh, uh, court injunctions to prevent these documents from being released. There'll be people fighting it. It's just... It's like pulling teeth, trying to get the facts out of these uh, bureaucracies. But we will see exactly what is learned, and uh, if anything at all. <clears throat> While the rotten Reverend Clinton has failed again, all she does is fail and lose. Because there's no question in my mind that the demonic buzzard uh, her, had her talons deep into the... Uh, to the uh, activities uh, that have been going on uh, with the impeachment and everything else. And I think that this was the Rotten Reverend Clinton's final hard play. Uh, that's what the Mueller investigation was all about, that she paid for. That is what the FISA warrants that led to the Mueller investigation were all about, that she paid for. That's what the witch hunt was all about, that she paid for. That's what the dossier was all about, that she paid for. I have no doubt that she was involved uh, in uh, the Ukraine hoax to some degree. Um, I have no doubt that her, 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 we already know that her, when we know this from Christopher Steele, uh, we know this, uh, the Rotten Reverend Clinton has always believed that her best bet at getting power would be to drive Trump out of office uh, through impeachment. She knew that she couldn't go through the courts, which was her original plan. But once Christopher Steele's information turned out to be garbage, she knew that she could no longer count on the legal process so that she had to work the political angle. That would be impeachment. And her ultimate goal was to have Trump removed so that she could run against a damaged Republican Party and a weakened Mike Pence, who would then become president. And I think that that was, she thought, her best bet because I think she knows that in a head-to-head -head match with Trump, she will lose worse than she lost in 2016. So now, I think that the rotten Reverend Clinton knows that most of her hopes are dashed. And even if they do try to have, even if they get a brokered convention and they try to move her name forward for the nomination, now I'm not so sure the rotten Reverend Clinton wants it because I don't know that she wants to get uh, embarrassed again. I don't think her intention was to run against Trump. Her plan was to have Trump removed from office. Uh, and then she could come back and run the campaign and say, see, I've been vindicated. Trump was thrown out. It should have been mine to begin with. I should have been the anointed one in 2016, but I got cheated. And now that the smoke's cleared and Trump is gone, it's all been proven. Now anoint me in 2020. I think that this was her thinking all along. But as we can see, she's now been thwarted. Not to say that the demo, demo commies and the rotten reverend will stop. They might try some more efforts at impeachment, um, but that would be I would be extremely ill-advised. I think just about anyone <clears throat> in the party, uh, having seen that the entire fiasco was a massive fail. Uh, Trump is now at his highest approval rating ever. Uh, he kind of. Um, is now getting the sympathy vote from a lot of people, seeing how he's been beat on. Uh, they can see the great job that he's doing. And so I think that even the demo commies, I'm not talking about people like Pelosi and the ones who are, you know, stage five uh, TDS. I'm talking about the sane people 
at the high levels of the corporate Democratic Party that realize that this was a massive fail and to try to do this again would be even worse. And I think that some of those, you know, uh, clearer heads will probably prevail uh, the second time around and try to stop this if they try to go forward with another impeachment, which you can bet that uh, Schiff and Nadler and Pelosi will. But I think that probably some wiser people uh, in the background, the people who really control the Democratic Party, they will probably do everything they can to make sure that that does not happen because they are terrified that they're going to get a Bernie, uh, commie Bernie uh, nominee. And that's their biggest fear right now. Uh, forget Trump. As far as they're concerned, uh, Trump's the default position. If uh, Wall Street and uh, other groups like that get four more years of Trump, they can probably live with that because they are making a lot of money. Um, uh, but they're having to do it legally and honestly now and ethically uh, as opposed to them to work for it now as opposed to just raking it off the top. So they realize they still have opportunity with Trump, but with a commie Bernie, uh, that would be a big problem. So they will probably default to Trump over commie Bernie, and I think that they will probably make the argument uh, to anyone trying to push another impeachment that it failed miserably the first time. It only benefited Trump. He came out stronger, not weaker. And with the election being so close that you know, they'll probably tell Democrats, you better focus on your number one objective, which is to stop Bernie from taking over this party. And even if we have to go with a weak candidate, uh, like a Buttigieg or a Bloomberg or, or someone like that, uh, that will still be better to lose to Trump uh, than to uh, have commie Bernie end up getting the nomination. Uh, the problem that they have, again, as everyone knows, it's not, you don't have to be a genius political analyst to understand this, is that there's really no way for the demo commies to win. If they, if they thwart Bernie and cheat him, and they are, and they will, uh, they're going to have a lot of disgruntled Bernie bros uh, who will not come out and vote uh, for Democrats. In fact, some, in spite of the Democratic Party, will come vote for Trump. Uh, that will cost them the election. If they nominate Bernie, that will also cost them the election. There's really no way they can win in this deal. Bernie has created a problem for them. And um, they really messed up in a big way um, when they didn't just tell Bernie straight up, uh, you know, you're not a Democrat, you're an independent. Now, this is a Democratic primary. If you want to run for president, run as an independent because we're not going to allow you to run as a Democrat. You can't just keep flipping as an independent and then change as a Democrat to run for office and then turn right around and go back to being an independent. He's played that game on them in 2016. That was the angle they should have played to stop Bernie, but they didn't do it, didn't see it coming, or I don't know what their thinking is, but that would have been better. That would have been better on their behalf than to allow him uh, to get back into the race in 2020 and cheat him again. That's going to work out worse. Uh, so uh, maybe, again, they're delusional and they think that they can, They maybe they think that the hatred for Trump is so great that even Bernie bros will vote for the establishment. But that shows that they don't understand the, the thinking of people who really um, are true believers. It's just like Ron Paul supporters. Uh, we almost didn't mind if, if Obama beat McCain or Romney because as far as we were concerned, there was no difference. You know, Romney, McCain. Uh, I mean, Romney, Obama. Well, not much difference. Romney, you know, McCain, Obama. Really not much difference. Uh, so, like to the Ron Paul supporters, we were happy to punish the Republican Party by not voting for them, knowing we probably were electing Obama. That's how we thought, many of us. And I think the same is true with the Bernie bros. They, they would rather punish the Democrats for cheating Bernie again than, than you know, vote for, um, uh, you know, a, an establishment Democrat. And that's just, that's the psyche uh, of people. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, it's an epic fail. Uh, you know, this is, this is what's ultimately going to come to a head at the convention. I plan on doing a video about this uh, probably in the next uh, two weeks, as soon as I'm completely over my bronchitis, which I do have bronchitis. I uh, went on antibiotics yesterday, so I expect here in about three or four days I'll be, I'll be uh, feeling very well, uh, normal, and uh, then I'm going to uh, put together a, a separate video. It'll be a separate video uh, on the 
uh, comparisons between 68 uh, D DNC convention and the 2020 DNC uh, convention, I think some of you will find that pretty interesting. Uh, a little history lesson there. Um, so, yes, we'll be doing that. Um, <clears throat> You know, one of the biggest stories that uh, media doesn't want to talk about, and the reason why they're okay to talk about the failure of the uh, of the bad app in Iowa and the fallout from that, one reason that they're happy to keep that alive is because they don't want to talk about the thing that really is probably the, the most important thing that we learned from the Iowa uh, caucus is that uh, turnout for the Democrats was down 30%. Now, um, this is really important. Uh, because if we see the same thing in New Hampshire, and then we see the same thing in South Carolina, and we see a similar thing lining up uh, on Super Tuesday, it'll give us a lot of insight as to the general feeling of the Democrat uh, Party, the electorate, and how they're feeling. Because the whole idea that the Democrats and the left-wing media have been pushing for the past three years is that the Democrats are going to beat Trump because there are going to be so many angry people foaming at the mouth, dying, just dying to get to the polls to vote, to vote Trump out, to vote for a Democrat, to defeat Trump, that it's this overwhelming enthusiasm is going to uh, be with the de Democratic electorate, and they're going to come and vote in huge numbers and uh, beat Trump. But as we can see, the opposite is true. It's Trump supporters who are waiting for 24 hours out in the freezing cold uh, to, to go to Trump rallies, packing arenas with 10, 20,000 people. 175,000 people requested tickets. In Jersey, uh, we can see the enthusiasm for Trump and Republicans. They're the ones who are dying to get to the polls in 2020. Uh, they'll, they'll crawl in their belly uh, five miles through broken glass and barbed wire to vote for Trump. But we can see that the enthusiasm that we were told was on the other side, that was what is the thing that was going to turn 2020 for the Democrats, we can see that if this is any indication of what the next few primaries are going to be, uh, that the enthusiasm factor in, uh, in the Democratic Party is not by any stretch of the imagination uh, something that, that's really high. It's actually 30 percent down. And if this continues to be the case, uh, not only will Trump win, he will win in a massive landslide. Uh, all the factors that are lining up, Trump uh, doing, uh, doubling his, uh, uh, his numbers amongst minority voters, and the Democrats' enthusiasm uh, gap being at negative 30 compared to uh, Republicans, which are showing a positive enthusiasm gap. There will likely be more people voting Republican in 2020. These two factors alone spell complete and massive, large-scale epic uh, d uh, disaster of biblical proportions for 2020. And that's been my analysis for quite some time. But the left-wing media and the Dems have been trying to push a fake narrative. And now, uh, as the numbers are coming in, even they are uh, not wanting to, but they're even having to uh, admit that the, the enthusiasm is not quite what they thought it should be or would be. Well, um, the backlash on uh, Pelosi galore has been overwhelming today. That's probably the biggest thing that came out of the uh, State of the Union speech. Uh, there was a couple people put up videos from the C-SPAN call-in show, and you had Democrat after Democrat after Democrat calling in to tell C-SPAN that they were disgusted by uh, Pelosi galore, uh, ripping up the speech, which she had already pre-torn those pages uh, of the speech so that, you know, that, that would, the shredding of the speech would go correctly. So the idea that this was just something she did uh, on the cuff is not true. She had been, you know, planning on doing that. So uh, that lie has been dispelled. But truly, the blowback on Pelosi galore uh, is uh, being shown today. And uh, I think it will continue to get worse. She is going to continue to lose confidence in her party. And uh, remember, <laughs> it was... Ocasio-Cortez, who after like two weeks into the uh, House side of the so-called investigation, that after only two weeks of that, uh, after pushing Madam uh, Botox uh, galore into this impeachment thing, AOC comes out and tweets out, yeah, I'm bored with impeachment. Let's move on to something else. <laughs> By which time, uh, Pelosi galore was already totally committed. So, you know, this is this is the kind of schizophrenia that she's dealing with. 
and that whole party is the party of schizophrenia. Uh, they should change themselves from the Democratic Party to the schizophrenic party. They are, they are in a world of hurt, my friends. Uh, and we should also note that that individual who was removed from the State of the Union address was one of the fathers, uh, possibly one of the victims of the Parkland shooting. He was a personal guest of Pelosi galore. We had Chris Ray uh, again, Nadler held that hearing yesterday with Christopher No Shit Sherlock Ray, and a couple of interesting things happened there. There was about three or four times when Jordan and a couple other Republicans pushed Christopher Ray, seemed to say like, man, it's just what bothers us is you don't seem to be too angry about all this. And No Shit Sherlock Ray was basically saying, well, look, you know, yeah, it's just not my personality. It's just not my personality to, 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 to be that, you know, like that. So maybe you're just interpreting that based on my personality. I'm just kind of a low-key person. But he said, um, we referred every single person from the FBI in the IG report uh, to their internal people within the FBI that do these types of things, that do deal out the punishments. And he also said that on about four or five times, he said, hey, look, you know, you're forgetting something. Uh, he said, John Durham is currently conducting this investigation and I am fully cooperating with Durham. So he said, the jury's not in yet. He said, before you get totally criticize me for not doing anything, let's wait till after Durham finishes his investigation, then I'll come back here and then we'll talk about the types of penalties or punishments that were actually dealt out. He says it's too early to talk about that because Durham's investigation is going on and I am 100% uh, cooperating with Durham every step of the way. So we will see um, that is a decent point that Ray is making here. Not that I'm a fan because I obviously know I strongly dislike Christopher No Shit Sherlock Ray, but um, he is making the point that he's keeping his powder dry and cooperating with the Durham investigation. And he seemed to suggest to me that when he made that statement that I'll come back to you after the Durham investigation is over and then we'll we'll talk about punishments and various things like that. So he seemed to be suggesting to me that when he comes back next time after the Durham investigation is over that he won't have to put up with being accused of not showing a little more emotion uh, in regards to all the things that uh, are going on, uh, whether or not they're dealing out the, the proper discipline or punishments or whatever. So he seems to be going with the jury still out, wait for Durham's investigation, uh, and uh, then we'll come back and talk about it. So anyway, if you weren't aware of that, that is what went down yesterday in the House and the Penguins Committee. Uh, Judicial Watch posting up on their website. Of course, we know they received another, I believe, 144 pages of um, emails. Uh, and these emails confirm, once again, uh, Bill Priestap admitting that he had the final word on whether to launch Operation Crossfire Hurricane. And he did give the final word to launch Operation Crossfire Hurricane. Uh, whether or not Priestap is going to uh, say that he was, you know, fooled or, or what have you, uh, we don't know. Uh, but he's taking the primary responsibility for opening the Crossfire uh, Hurricane investigation uh, in, this, um, in this, uh, these released emails. Uh, we also learn that the more evidence um, that the Rotten Reverend Clinton email investigation was rigged, more emails showing the conversations that were going on between FBI and DOJ, uh, where there was conflict there, there was a couple people within the DOJ and the FBI uh, who were trying to, it appears, uh, have somewhat of, a, of an honest investigation, and they were running into a lot of pushback from others who were pushing back and trying to get them to back off. So you can clearly see from these new emails from Judicial Watch, uh, there was a lot of push and pull and, and infighting going on between FBI and DOJ, people on both sides uh, of both those departments on both sides of the issue. So there, clearly there was uh, conflict uh, going on there. And of course, we know who won the day. Uh, and that was probably because Attorney General Lynch uh, made it perfectly clear that, uh, you know, along with Comey, that they were going to let the Rotten Reverend Clinton off the hook. We also have an email in here 
um, where uh, we learn a little bit more about the Seth Rich thing. Um, apparently, it was Jonathan Maffa uh, who put the kibosh on the Seth Rich questions. Apparently, uh, Strzok and Page had discussed Seth Rich, and they were, you know, a little rattled about the questions about Seth Rich. They kicked it back to Maffa, and Maffa basically dealt with the issue. Then he emails Strzok back and tells Peter, it's been stroking us. Uh, basically, don't worry about it. I took care of it. It's been put away. So here we have Jonathan Maffa telling Peter's been stroking us that uh, he took care of shutting down the people who were pushing uh, on the investigation into Seth Rich and everything that went on there. But there needs to be a lot more uh, that needs to uh, be looked into about that. And again, Ty Clevenger, the lawyer for Mr. Butowski, has uh, forwarded a ton of information he's collected, including interviews with William Benny and various other people on the technical side, a lot of other evidence uh, that he's given to John Durham. Whether or not John Durham goes down that road, I don't know. Uh, I think John Durham is focused primarily on the origins of the investigation into the Trump campaign more so than the origins of the, <clears throat> of the email server stuff and, and, and that part of the Russian collusion thing. Uh, it's possible that he could be going down that road, but I would say probably not. Uh, not that I think he'll totally ignore it, but I think at some point he has to draw the line uh, on his investigation as to what he's going to focus on. You know, it's at some point you got to kind of say, okay, this is the parameters, because if you just open up everything, well, he could be investigating for 20 years. Because everything leads to everything, leads to everything, leads to everything. You could go on and on and on. At some point, you have to say, this is the parameter. And I think that'll probably be focused. Uh, it will probably stay within the parameters of the origins of the investigation. And I think that the email server stuff and the, and, and the private server and the Russians hacking the DNC, I think that stuff is probably on the peripheral. And uh, so my guess is he's not going to do much with that, but I could be wrong. We'll just have to wait and see. We also have um, Mr. Potato Head and Rand Paul getting into a Twitter battle. We had uh, Brennan, Mr. Potato Head, tweeting about the fact that Rand Paul dropped the whistleblower's name, Sharamella, five times on the Senate floor. And that um, led Mr. Potato Head to send out a tweet saying, quote, Rand Paul is beneath contempt he typifies the worst of Trump's craven enablers. History will revile all of you. Uh, and so Rand Paul retweeted back to uh, Brennan, Mr. Potato Head. You want to know what a mockery of public service is, John? Killing 500 people outside of any judicial system. Drone strikes of American citizens. Approving British spies to present a dossier of lies paid for by Hillary. Lying to Congress alone should shut you up. Well done, Rand Paul. Uh, a couple other things. Matt Whitaker on Sebastian Gorka's program saying to that we should trust that Barr and Durham are going to hold people accountable. Uh, and of course, I was just looking every day, I look into Durham and uh, you know he's still the US attorney up there in Connecticut and every day he sentences people. He signs off on jail sentences or, or indictments on people every day. You know, just to give you an idea, uh, just yesterday, John Durham sentenced a crack dealer to four years in prison. Four years in prison to a crack dealer. I wonder what he'll do to people who carry out a coup. We learned that John Bolton, we learned from legal documents in a court case that John Bolton uh, uh, did pocket $115,000 from Ukrainian oligarch Viktor Pinchuk, who was the single largest donor to the Clinton campaign. Uh, and we learned that uh, the speech, uh, the approval for Trump's speech was 97% for Republicans, 82% for independents, even 30% for Democrats, which gives you an overall average of pretty close to 70% of the three average approve of Trump's State of the Union speech. Thanks so much. Have a good night. I'll be back tomorrow. See you. Bye.